I'm going to talk about new dimensions, new maps, uh, changing concepts of state sovereignty and political geography. States are increasingly challenged to control territory, resources, populations, institutions within their borders. This isn't just failed or failing states, which analysts have observed for a long time. We believe that this phenomenon is taking place within states that were previously believed or still believed to be stable, many of them western states. And that importantly, while this may not mean that these states will crumble and, and fall apart, that, that does drain resources from the state and does undermine the ability of states to govern. Now this isn't a necessarily new phenomenon. Uh, if you go back uh, to 1945, the founding of the United Nations, there were I believe 50 or 51 members, and today there are 193 members of, uh, of the United Nations. So proliferation of states has almost been fourfold in the span of nearly 70 years. So the idea that our dimensions of our political system change should not be new. However, I don't think that a lot of observers and analysts and national security and corporate security planners really reflect on the idea that our borders and boundaries, whether they be de jure de facto borders and boundaries, are changing and that our political geography is changing. I think many of us uh, take for granted the idea that the boundaries we'll have tomorrow will be very similar to the ones that we have today. And I think even talking about the number of actual states uh, in the United Nations doesn't even get at the complexity of this issue. Um, while the United Nations has 193 members, there are several states that are not part of the UN, Vatican City, Taiwan. Um, in addition, other states uh, recognize a different number of, of, of sovereign entities as well. The United States Department of State recognizes 195 states. The International Olympic Committee, which has a vested interest in understanding how populations group themselves and identify themselves, has 204 members. In FIFA, the international governing body of world football has 209 members. IHS Country Risk and Forecasting Team monitors 203 political entities. So we can't even decide and determine today and agree upon what constitutes a sovereign entity. What this means in our estimation is that we're beginning to see new types of sovereignty arrangements and new types of behaviors out of sovereign states and, and, and centers of, of governance throughout the world. Um, ultimately, we believe that the dimensions of our international system, the political geography, will change. Uh, maybe the boundaries won't be formally redrawn. In some cases it will, in some cases it won't. But ultimately, these new dimensions will require national security planners and security officers uh, to draw new maps. I think it's a work in progress, actually, uh, uh, and that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time on my team doing, is trying to categorize the different types of behaviors and sovereignty arrangements that we see. Um, but I think it's worth putting at least a stake in the ground, a few stakes in the ground, uh, uh, to identify some of the big categories. I think the first one, and probably if you think of the spectrum from left being most stable to right being least stable or, or changing sovereignty, um, on the left you'd see stable functional states that are increasingly challenged. And I think the United States would not be a bad example here where there's no real concern today about the United States failing or not existing in 5, 10, 15 years, but there is a very vigorous dialogue and debate within the country about what the republic stands for and what role government has to play in, in the lives of its citizens. Um, similarly, in, in throughout Western Europe, throughout most of the West, and indeed in, in, in states like China, there are sovereignty challenges. There are uh, protests. There are indeed this week in Turkey and Brazil, you see more and more of these types of popular uprisings uh, which seem to be more intense and more frequent. Um, there's also I think the second stake in the ground is probably shared, willingly shared sovereignty. And again there are various manifestations of this, but I, I think of Lebanon which um, back in 2006 there was a 30-day war fought entirely within the borders of Lebanon which killed thousands of Lebanese citizens and displaced tens of thousands of Lebanese citizens. That was fought between two militaries, neither one of which was the Lebanese army. Lebanon stayed neutral in this conflict between Hezbollah and Israel, uh, in large part because Hezbollah was a more capable military entity and this is part of the shared sovereignty arrangement that Lebanon has reached uh, in order to control all of that territory, even if it doesn't actually control most of southern Lebanon. Um, to stay, the Lebanese government has reached to stay in power. I think the third sort of stake in the ground is less willingly shared sovereignty or contested shared sovereignty. Um, 
And I think a good example might be Kurdistan in Iraq, um, where there is clear tension between the, the Kurdish regional government and the government of Iraq based on a range of, of factors, ethnic tensions, certainly economic and energy issues. Um, sometimes the, the relationship is amenable, other times it's quite tense, and, and indeed in the last three or four months there have been um, standoffs between, between Kurdish military and government of Iraq military. Um, not to suggest that this will immediately in, erupt into civil war, but only that this is an uneasy relationship and an uneasy shared sovereignty. Um, the next one is fully contested uh, sovereignty. And in this case, you have uh, countries like Syria, where there is actually open uh, conflict, uh, challenges to the authority of the state and to the sovereignty, uh, to the ability of, of the government to rule. Um, the last stake in the ground is new states. And, you know, I think one of the indicators that this is a universal phenomenon and not just one that afflicts again, Somalia or other states that we consider failed or failing, is that the next new state that we might see in the international system is not a state that will have come uh, to existence through some bloody uh, civil war or, or ethnic violence. It could be Scotland. I think this is a really big deal for national security and defense planners and corporate security officers as well. I, I think most fundamentally it means that they need to evaluate their views of where control, influence, and, and power really lies, uh, and I think ultimately redraw some of the maps uh, of, of the regions that they're, they're focused on. First, uh, stakeholder and influence calculus might change. If, if the stakeholders and the, the groups or individuals that hold uh, power and control of resources are not the government, uh, learning and understanding how better to engage with those uh, those stakeholders and influences can be a challenge and certainly something that national security communities and corporate security officers need to take into consideration. Secondly, this does highlight the importance of border security and control for central governments. Third, in environments in where there is not effective control of borders and boundaries, I think it's fair for national security planners uh, to assume that there will be conflict and competition along these borders and boundaries and trying to anticipate and identify the areas and the borders that are going to be uh, where, where violent conflict uh, is most likely to erupt, I think, is an important intelligence and national security challenge. And finally, uh, in areas where there is not sufficient control, we can also expect criminal and extremist activity to thrive. I think we've seen this in, in certain parts of the world, in, in North Africa, where borders and boundaries may not be as, as, uh, as rigid as in other parts of the world, and we've seen the proliferation of, of this type of, of uh, illicit activity. This is definitely uh, relevant for corporate security planners as well, particularly the stakeholder and influence calculus. Um, it's not just about control of resources, but also about labor pools, who are the key influencers that will allow you to successfully operate in an environment. Um, this may not be best uh, affected through central governments. It probably, in many cases, is better uh, affected through dealing with local tribal leaders or, 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 or local governments. So understanding who controls populations and resources will become a fundamental task for industries that are operating in parts of the world where they are not familiar.